This is Optimal Finance Daily, episode 1848, The Values of Value Investing, by Vitaly Kassanelson of ContrarianEdge.com. And I'm your host and personal finance enthusiast, Diana Merriam. Now let's get to today's post as we optimize your life. The Values of Value Investing by Vitaly Kassanelson of ContrarianEdge.com. I organize a conference every summer called Value X Vail. Vail is a quaint, beautiful, ritzy ski resort tucked away in the gorgeous Rocky Mountains, about 100 miles from Denver. One day, I received an email from a reader asking why I, a value investor, would have a conference in an expensive place like Vail. He suggested that as a true value investor, I should hold the conference in a hotel somewhere by the airport where prices were much cheaper. His precise comment was, quote, I thought value investors were supposed to like cheap stuff, end quote. This email challenged my value investment hood. It made me question my value investing values. Was that reader right? Was I straying from value investor traditions? Maybe I should rename the conference Value X Motel 6 and hold it at a $36 a night remote airport hotel. I recognize that the notion was slightly silly, but it started me pondering, what are the values of value investing? Let's think about the Bible of value investing. Ben Graham's 1949, The Intelligent Investor. Graham spent a lot of time talking about cheap stocks. He defined them as the ones that trade at single digit price earnings multiples, trade at a discount to book value, or trade below their cash value, net nets. Graham placed great emphasis on statistical cheapness. His flavor of value investing is tangible, staring you in the face. It requires very little imagination. You just need to close your eyes, plug your nose, take a deep breath, and buy whatever you scrape off the bottom of the stock market abyss. What Warren Buffett calls the cigarette butt approach to investing. But if the only thing you get out of Graham's teachings is to buy statistically cheap stocks, then you're shortchanging yourself. This analysis is one dimensional and ignores much that is important. In one of my articles, I called Charlie Munger Warren Buffett's sidekick. Jeff Matthews, a friend and the author of Pilgrimage to Warren Buffett's Omaha, sent me an impassioned note saying, Charlie's not a sidekick. Charlie changed Buffett's investment philosophy. Sidekicks don't do that. He went on, quote, at Munger's 90th birthday party, Buffett pulled out an old yellowed letter that Munger had written back in the day where Munger actually told Buffett explicitly that he had to change, that the cigar butt stuff wouldn't scale, that it was better to buy good businesses even if the price wasn't dirt cheap. I thought that was astonishing, maybe the most insightful thing I'd ever heard about Munger. He didn't just talk about it. He actively pushed Buffett to change. Literally, without Munger, there's no Berkshire as we know it, end quote. Munger turned Buffett from being a one-dimensional to a three-dimensional investor. The two dimensions he introduced are quality and growth. The statistical value investor doesn't even have to be good at math. The counting skills you acquired in kindergarten are enough. As long as the price to earnings ratio of the stock you wanna buy doesn't exceed the number of digits you have on two hands, you're a Ben Graham value investor. But as Munger pointed out, this one dimensional strategy is not scalable. You have only a few opportunities in your lifetime to assemble a portfolio of in your face, statistically cheap stocks that are decent businesses. All other times, you'll end up owning a lot of melting ice cubes. The quality and growth dimensions may lack in-your-face tangibility. They're often more difficult to quantify, but are very important sources of value. Let's look at quality. A high-quality, mature company that is barely growing earnings, think Coca-Cola, is like an inflation-protected bond. This company dominates its industry, and its existing, keyword, business, generates a high return on capital but it cannot put this capital to work at these high rates because it already has a large market share in an industry with GDP-like growth. As an investor, you'll collect dividends that will grow with inflation. 
you'll make or lose money on the stock price depending on the pendulum swing of price to earnings around the fair or par value, which will also appreciate in line with inflation. From today's perch, in a world where investors are starved for yield, mature high quality businesses trade like very, very expensive bond substitutes. Their price to earning ratio pendulum puts their value much above par. Growth is a tricky dimension. On a standalone basis, it means very little and can often be dangerous. A company that grew earnings at a fast pace in the past, but lacked a sustainable competitive advantage, a bedrock of quality, will invite competition that will destroy current and future profitability. When you combine growth with quality, however, the mixture is magical and will result in a lot of value. Think Apple. This value lies in future earnings. Another way to say the same thing is a high quality company with a high return on capital married to a significant growth runway, the ability to reinvest at a high rate in the future, will create significant value, which will not be observable in last year's or even next year's earning power, but years from now. Think about some of Buffett's best investments, American Express and Geico. Both had significant competitive advantages. In the case of Geico, it sold directly to consumers and thus was a low-cost producer in a commodity industry. American Express simply had an unassailable brand. Both had a huge growth runway ahead when Buffett purchased them. If Graham's intelligent investor is the Bible of value investing, then what should we learn from it? Don't trade stocks like you would trade sardines. View them as partial ownership of businesses. Mr. Market is there to serve you, not the other way around. And of course, there is the margin of safety, buying stocks at a discount to what they're worth. But a discount to worth doesn't equate to statistically cheap. A $36 a night room at Motel 6 by the airport, overrun by cockroaches and bedbugs and with questionable plumbing, may be statistically cheap, but it's not a bargain. If I held my investment conference in a hotel like that, it wouldn't be attended by anyone other than the vermin that are already there. You just listened to the post titled The Values of Value Investing by Vitaly Kassanelson of contrarianedge.com. So I talked to my friend Frank Vasquez from the Risk Parity Radio podcast about this article because I don't often find myself contemplating value stocks. Frank pointed out that the big picture backdrop here is that academics have long observed since the 90s that value stocks and particularly small cap value stocks tend to outperform the rest of the market over long periods of time. But this has been turned on its head since the great financial crisis in 2008 and large cap growth stocks like the FANGs have outperformed by large margins. Contemplating value stocks is really rooted in trying to beat the market by investing in particular sectors. However, we don't need to beat the market to be successful in investing. The fact of the matter is, as mere mortals, we cannot know what's going to perform better in the future. What really matters is our portfolio allocation mix of types of investments like stocks, bonds, and REITs, not what's in each bucket. The reason is because all reasonably well-diversified 100% equity portfolios are going to perform at least 90% the same. Likewise, all reasonably well-diversified 80-20 or 60-40 stock-to-bond portfolios are going to perform at least 90% the same. So as long as we get that piece right, we should just focus on owning low-cost diversified funds and not get hung up on growth versus value or small cap versus large cap. Again, we don't need to be able to predict the future to succeed, and our success is not defined by beating the market, but rather by meeting our individual financial goals. And that will do it for today. Have a great day and start to your weekend and month. Thank you for listening, and I'll be back here reading to you tomorrow, where your optimal life awaits.